All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to She Plays the Podcast. I am super excited today to be joined by Yulia Stolyarenko. She fights in the bantamweight division of the UFC Ultimate Fighting Championship. She's a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. All around, just badass, really. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and where are you currently? Uh, in Lithuania, in my hometown, Gonos. Yeah, how has it been COVID-wise? where you are um when covid started when the first like wave uh, start uh, happened uh, i actually just came from my invicta title fight uh, in kansas city and it just happened that i came back home on monday on tuesday we shut down our gym and on friday the whole country was shut down Wow. And uh, I just was lucky to, to have my fight just before we shut down. And uh, yeah, we actually was closed. All the country was closed for like two months. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, right now we are like the second wave is coming in Europe and in our country also. And uh, actually from Monday, we uh, actually from today, we closed our gym already also again oh. for the second wave. Yeah. Yeah, so as an athlete where, you know, going to a gym is pretty necessary, I would think. How has that affected your career even, you know, just training-wise? You know, it, uh, but the first wave was a little bit, like, it was difficult for our gym. It was difficult for everybody. But, uh, again, I was lucky because I just had a fight. And uh, actually, my body needed uh, to heal up and just to get some rest after the fight. So if uh, the shutdown would be just for one month it would be perfect for me but it was a bit longer so uh, like two weeks i did nothing just to, to, to rest up and later my athletic coach uh, he used to send me uh, like a athletic like uh, my strength and conditioning uh, trainings every day so i did it by my own in my uh, mom's uh, hometown visaginas uh, and uh, actually as uh, also i was lucky because uh, I came to my mom, uh, my mom is living uh, like four hours from me and I came to her for two days and I stuck here for two months because uh, all the country shut down and uh, this town is, was a perfect town for to be closed during the like uh, quarantine because it's all around the forests, lakes and so on and you actually could get out of the apartment and do some stuff, so do some workouts in the forest. So in that case it wasn't a big problem for me. Also, me and my coach, uh, my technical coach in MMA, uh, we used to do like uh, uh, like messenger uh, video conferences and uh, he tried to work on my technique uh, through the webcam. Yeah, it was kind of like funny, but actually later we just checked it. Like when I came back to my hometown for trainings, he was like, okay, that was pretty useful for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Just adapting during yeah, yeah. this crazy year. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. So you mentioned a post fight and that was one of my questions I was like really excited to ask. So what, what does it look like pre like leading up to a fight, fight day, post fight? <laughs> like take us through that whole experience. Uh, you know, if you get a proper fight uh, in a proper time, so usually we have around uh, six or eight weeks before fight for preparation and uh, as big a fight as like harder preparation and uh, i think the, the hardest part of us it's not the fight it's preparing for the fight mm -hmm. uh preparing all the tools all the skills all your physical conditioning uh, and so on so that's probably the hardest uh, six or eight weeks uh, in your life <laughs> uh the fight week is not so hard because usually uh, like everything is like slow down so it's more about weight cut it's more about like uh giving your body a bit to rest before the main work uh and uh, yeah again the hardest part is uh, is the weight cut because in may we have uh, pretty big weight cuts uh, like uh, with the water in the hot tubs and so on. Like, uh, for example, I caught uh, around 20 pounds in my last week. So it's oh. like, yeah. And, uh, you know, like it's a pretty big work in last week for us. Uh, and uh, after the fight, it still depends on what kind of fight you had. It, it, it was the easier fight. Uh, sometimes you don't really need like uh, a lot of rest, but uh, I think the healing process is not uh, all, always about the fight. It's also about preparation because uh, 
you know, uh, if you have a proper preparation and if your physical conditioning is on, on the very top, uh, you usually go really low after a fight and, and it doesn't matter how like good or bad fight was. It's just because your body is shutting down every, every system after the fight just because you got to the point where your physical conditioning is the best and it cannot handle it for too long time. Because mm -hmm. uh, like in reality, I feel great only like two days. Like, uh, and, but on the day of a fight, when you wake up, you actually feel that your body just want to jump. It's, oh, wow. it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty interesting feeling. Uh, if everything was made correctly, like I'm really lucky to have my physical preparation coach who I'm like working for last two years with him. And when I started to work with him, I started to feel what like athlete's body really feels like and what it means to be on your best shape. Yeah. That's awesome. I bet that does change your perspective on what you're doing. I mean, it just feels oh, yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it changed a lot of things and uh, it actually changed a lot of preparation and and so on. And the, it, the, you can literally see that uh, on the fight and you can feel that on the fight, mm -hmm. how it changes your body. Very cool. Could you talk a little bit about your team? Like, I, I don't know if you've watched it all. There's a show on Netflix called The Kingdom that's all about yeah. MMA. I love it. But I like, I'm learning. I learned so much. Like, you know, fighters typically have a gym that they go train at. And like, there's a couple other fighters on the team, you know, but could you talk a little bit about the different coaches and kind of what that looks like in your corner? The thing is Kingdom is uh, actually, they made a pretty good job, uh, like uh, explaining the life in American academies. Like uh, I, I had some trainings in American academies also. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I have friends who train here and I know a lot of stories. So yeah, that's pretty accurate. In Lithuania, it's a little bit different because, uh, you know, we're just building a MMA system here. Uh, I'm the first uh, fighter from my country who got to UFC, uh, who was born and raised in, uh, in Lithuania and got to UFC. So we're just doing the first baby steps in that uh, thing. And uh, right now, uh, like my gym, we... We have a striking coach, we have my main coach, jiu-jitsu coach, but actually my coach is like, my jiu-jitsu coach, he is my main coach in May. It's a person who brought me to MMA uh, and uh, who explained me what MMA is, who gave me a dream, basically. And uh, he figures out uh, everything in my career. So actually, like, started from... Uh, technique uh, and uh, everything else uh, like management uh, and everything like we're doing by our own everything also we brought uh, to my team uh, athletic coach uh, who is uh, in basic he is uh, a coach for the sprinters uh, you know like uh, uh, we decided to ask him to coach me as a straight conditioning because uh, like naturally I'm pretty slow person uh, I'm like uh, uh, and uh, we needed to make me a, a more explosive uh, and we got really good guy he's he's young actually he's like my age but uh, that that guy he's so interested in everything he he started everything like what uh, he could uh, just to bring me as close as possible like to preparation of the fighters and he's not stuck just on fighters like what like coaches uh, in america do or something like that he's trying to create what what you need for bringing like athletic uh, skills uh, on your top. Not, not just everybody does, but like what fits for me as an athlete, so exactly for me. And uh, it really works for me. So yeah, and uh, also we, sometimes we, I'm going to the camps, for example, to, to strike with the boxers, like separately. Like uh, I have also a guy uh, who used to be in uh, a really good MMA fighter in the past. Uh, he fought in Japan and so on. Rikas Petraitis, like, uh, he was a pretty big deal in Lithuania also. And uh, he helps me with wrestling also. Mm. So, yeah, so basically, uh, like, I have my gym fighter house. Uh, and uh, basically all I have is it's, it's like, like little group of, of the guys, you know, working. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, and you mentioned, you know, people, I think you said, yeah, a guy that's helping you who went to Japan. Have you been able to travel all over the world because of your writing? Uh, yeah, I actually lived in Japan, in the same Japan for over one year. Oh, yeah, cool. and I participated in the project uh, Seiza. I, and uh, actually, my, the beginning of my career was 
I had a lot of struggles with getting more fights because, you know, in Lithuania, I, I used to be only one uh, female. I was the first female fighter, uh, uh, like MMA professional female fighter from Lithuania who took it seriously. And uh, on my early stages, I could not get any amateur fights because it was nobody here. And that was the reason why I jumped uh, straight to the pro fights. I never had the amateur fights uh, in MMA. Uh, and uh, the thing was that uh, even abroad to get uh, pro fights was uh, like really hard for me and uh, like just like I used to fight once in a year for fights it's like it's like nothing if, if you fight one and once in a year it's like you're coming for a first fight every time uh, and uh, that was a big problem for me. And in 2016, uh, I finally attracted the organization, the eye of the organization in Lithuania, Bushido, who to, started to take care of me. And those guys brought uh, helped me to get to the Japan uh, to participate in Project Seiza. And Seiza was like modified to MMA uh project in uh, japan so it wasn't mma it was their own rules uh it was a striking it was also you could take down open and but everything uh, was with a gi uh and on the ground it was limited time and mma we don't have limited time and also it it happened not in normal arena it was in sumo arena so you could push out your opponent out of, uh, out of arena so it looked pretty fun for the people and so on but for me, the biggest plus was that I finally got experience that I could never have before because I finally started to get the fights. In one year, I got seven fights. For me, it was a big jump in my career because I started finally to feel my body. I started to feel how to fight. Uh, also in Japan, uh, I saw for the first time uh, left wave. Left wave is... Uh, uh, martial art from uh, Myanmar uh, and it's more famous as a Burmese boxing, bare knuckle boxing. So it's basically like Muay Thai so you can strike with your fist, you can strike with your feet, knees, elbows and also you can strike with your head, head butts. And the fight was uh, only for knockouts and when I saw it for the first time I was like damn I want to fight here and I started to scream everybody give me a fight here and uh, yeah, it also was like a big experience for me because uh, uh, I'm really thankful to Nakamura and the Japanese people who brought me uh, International Lightweight Federation Japan, who gave me like opportunity to fight here because uh, it was a very big experience. You're fighting bare knuckle uh, in like with the people you never fought before, like uh, for like pretty big audience, and uh, also like. It just happened that after my first fight in left way, like one of the biggest stars from Myanmar asked me for a fight and I was like, okay, let's fight, but for a title. And my title fight with that girl actually washed around, uh, how, how many, around 8 million people. And it was my second fight just in left way and they won that fight against their biggest star. So yeah, it's, it was a pretty huge thing for me and Japan has only like, like, like the best in my heart and like takes a really big part in my in my uh, in my memory and in my soul that's awesome that is so amazing to hear too like your second fight ever and you're you won a title that's ridiculous that's it's so not second fight ever like you know right I'm fight, like i'm fighting uh i'm in martial arts for 15 years right uh, and striking it's like long process for me and uh, when i won that fight i already was in striking for 12 years so it's not like second fight but sure. in that style yeah it was uh, just a second fight my i mean were the nerves going or are you like okay let's do this here we go <laughs> <laughs> i just enjoy it more <laughs> seriously i just love fighting so badly that i just enjoy it everything <laughs> that's awesome okay is there like a what's the safe way to headbutt someone What's like a um, way to do it that doesn't also damage you? It's like say we just to do that with forehead. Uh, actually, I I do, did not really do that because I'm not used to. But my opponents tried to, to do it on me, and I was like, 
uh, you drink, like clinch, clinch. <laughs> yeah, but I, I saw a pretty serious uh, head back knockouts uh, in that styles, like uh, in life. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty big uh, tool and uh, uh, it changes a lot of your game because like when you clinch, sometimes uh, in like in the same MMA, if we would have uh, headbutts, it will change the uh, game a lot. And uh, I would love that MMA will, uh, will start to include the headbutts also. Oh. But it is what it is. Like, um, people sometimes think that uh, it's too dangerous, but I think in MMA we should do that. Like, like it, it will change a lot of uh, people's games. It will change the uh, clinch game. Uh, work near the, like we have a pretty big part of the game near the near the cage when people clinch us and the head headbutts will change it a lot I think yeah I mean I've seen so many people just like wrapped up and it's like oh if you could yeah because you know sometimes when you clinch you can make a distance using your elbows but elbows it's like 20 centimeters from your body and for the head, you don't need those 20 centimeters. Right. It's already here, so you can already create the distance and you can create, already create the damage. So yeah, that will change a lot. And uh, I hope that in the future, it, uh, it will be allowed to do. Wow, yeah, that would be, that would be insane. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious too, because you said, you know, you're the first fighter out of Lithuania, professional UFC fighter. How did you get into uh, it's not like that. Uh, like, I'm not the first professional. I would say I'm the first professional female fighter from Lithuania. Yes. Sorry. Uh, who was raised and born in Lithuania. Because uh, oh, yeah, uh, also we have Rosna Mayunas, uh, who, 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 is, uh, who was a UFC champion. Uh, she's actually Lithuanian, or both of her parents Lithuanians, and she, uh, I love how she represents our country because she still talks a little bit Lithuanian and she still represents our country. Some, uh, but the fact is, she was born in America and raised, raised by, uh, by Americans and by American coaches. Uh, like the difference for me is that uh, I was born and raised in Lithuania and by Lithuanian coaches. And basically, the, the most true would say that my gym is the first gym who raised uh, UFC fights in Lithuania. That, that, that will be the most accurate. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so basically, I'm the first female fighter professional because before that was a girl who like have professional records but basically it was a girl who just went abroad uh, lose, lost her fights and took my money and come back like they, they never took it seriously gotcha. i was the first who took it seriously and uh, i am the first in ufc it doesn't matter guy or girl we had we used to have really good uh, mma fighters in the past uh, but they never got to the ufc yeah okay so your first ufc male or female from Lithuania coached in Lithuania yeah yeah okay wow and so how did you get into the sport I mean into the MMA I mean I think you said a coach introduced you to that but jiu-jitsu like was that just a passion like something you had interest in as a kid uh the story is longer actually um uh, I got to the martial arts when I was 12 years old uh and my dad brought me here and the thing is, when he was young, uh, he was a child of uh, exiled to Siberia uh, parents. So, you know, like in the USSR times, uh, there was uh, like a, a lot of exiles to Siberia and so on. And uh, like my grandparents was politically un incorrect for like, like everybody for USSR. Mm -hmm. And he was born in basically in Russia, and it wasn't like easiest times for everybody. And uh, also, martial arts was treated in USSR. Like it was a couple of martial arts, like sambo, like traditional sambo, a, a bit wrestling and so on. But you could not do, for example, karate and so on. Uh, and it was restricted. And my dad, when he was young, he used to get like illegal books about karate, about martial arts, kung fu, karate, and so on. And he rewrote it that by his hand, uh, the pictures by his hand, and so on. It was all illegal. And uh, I was born in uh, in uh, in 1985. I think my family came back to Lithuania. And uh, later, Lithuania got it independent, uh, and I was born and ready in an independent uh, country in Lithuania. But those books, I still was at our home. And I remember when I was younger, 
uh, I remember how I was looking for those books because you know it's it's all by the hand. It's pretty, it's it, it looked pretty cool. Uh, and my dad always had like in his mind something like about martial arts because he could never do that, but he always wanted like he always had was attracted to it. I even remember how I as a little kid I watched with him like kickboxing fights and so on. And when I was 12, I just was studied like, oh, I want to do some kind of sports and so on. And in the ha same uh, house, like we are, we are mostly in Lithuania living in apartments in my town, in my hometown. And on uh, in our apartment, uh, like in our, uh, like the same building, but in our apartment was living karate coach also. Okay. And the karate gym was just on uh, across the street. So my dad just really like, okay, you want to do sports? So let's try it <laughs> but nobody ever thought that I would go like professionally or something like that and even me I was like the biggest uh like I, I always was against professional sport because you know like sports are for, for the health but professional sport never gives you health <laughs> and uh, everybody thought that it will be just a, a hobby for me and so on and I, I also felt like that and when I was 18 years old I moved to to another town, to Kaunas, uh, for my studies. Uh, because I, I entered my university and I came here for university and I still wanted to, to continue my martial arts uh, like road. Uh, and this is how I got to my current coach, Donato Suktveris, and to my fighter house gym. Uh, and uh, in that place, I started to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And because uh, I did not have any background on on uh, on the grappling, uh, on uh, on the ground, on wrestling, and so on, and just had like karate striking. And also my uh, my coach started to completely change my striking style because he was like, "Okay, you can strike, but that's incorrect. <laughs> you cannot strike like that uh, in like in a like more universal fights because you know like." Karate striking is a little bit different from MMA striking and uh, you can use some techniques from here but uh, not everything and also my hand, hands used to be not here but like here because the strikes was on the in the body and so on and you know like uh, I, I was supposed to, do, to change a lot of things in striking also. So yeah that's kind of like a short story how I got to martial arts. That's cool though and that it took you kind of through your childhood but then also into college even that's really neat that it was kind of a uh, it's not college and it would have a different system but it was already university yeah is that, so is that when you're like 18 or older 18 18 18 okay okay yeah, I got to that time when I was 18 yeah okay cool um yeah I mean I think that's so neat so what what do you think is like the coolest part about being a professional fighter and then what's the hardest part uh, coolest parts just I feel living your dream like mm. if you're professional you are like focus on on your like on what you really like to do if you really like to do like it is me and you have all the focus only on that thing uh, and you can dedicate yourself uh, just for one thing that's uh, like and uh, without uh, focusing uh, on uh, just MMA, like having normal job or something like that, so you cannot reach uh, like a big goal in MMA. That was uh, my point when I finished university. Uh, I, I decided not to work and I, I actually had plans to go for the higher degree, for master's degree in another seat, uh, like in another country, in, in Norway to move. Uh, I, I had a plan, but uh, in 2015, I just decided like, uh, no, I, I cannot do sports like that if I want to be successful in May. Uh, and if I really want to see how far I can go, I should just stay in MMA and that's it. No work, no, no like master's degree and so on. I can do that later when I will grow up, like when I will be older, you know, like when May will be in the past for me. Right. And, until I'm young, I should try to, to focus uh, on my May and to reach my goals uh, as far as possible. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's probably a cool spot, but the hardest, of course, as in every job, like you have the struggles here. Uh, physically, it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, and also, uh, you know, 
psycho psychologically, I think it's the hardest part is, um, is mental part. Uh, especially after uh, when you lose fights, uh, like uh, sometimes it's really hard when you struggle. And not only after the lost fights, uh, sometimes, especially uh, during hard weeks uh, on the uh, training camp before the, the fights, I think the, the biggest struggle, it's not uh, physical, it's mental part. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine, especially you said cutting 20 pounds. I mean, like, the it's, that, of, that's, that's the easiest part seriously that's the easiest but like part the, but the mental part of like i mean you've got to be no, 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 no. And like we already used to do that it's not so hard oh man that's crazy like again in that show where they're wearing like the trash bags and they're sitting in the sauna i'm just like oh my gosh i can't imagine <laughs> seriously um, like uh, if I could put outside all the training, so all the mental stuff and so on, and to choose all that stuff or, or cutting weight, I can cut weight every day. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. That's amazing. Cool. Well, what do you have coming up next? And, um, and I'd love to hear too, like, where do you hope women's UFC continues to grow? Like, are there certain things that you want to see happen for the future and for, you know, kids to keep getting involved or kind of, what are your what are your hopes for the next couple of years? So, like UFC is already doing a great uh, job, and uh, with especially the female fighters. And uh, since uh, UFC got women's in in 2013, at 12, uh, women's first fight was, I think 2012. Yeah. Uh, so uh, since that time, uh, female uh, fights are getting really big. Like we have a main card, so we have a bigger stars so as a female in UFC. So. Uh, I'm pretty like calm about female role in the UFC because it's already pretty big and uh, we, uh, we uh, the UFC treats us equally as a man and we have the same rights, we have the same status and we have can reach the same goals as, as guys can do here. So in the UFC, it's, everything is fine with that thing. But uh, my biggest hopes are probably are related to my country because, uh, you know, one of my goals is like uh, I really want to see more fighters. We already got like when I was growing up and uh, when I just started my career, the first question always was who will be the first fighter in the UFC. Right now we have uh, me uh, as a UFC fighter. We also have Modestas Bukowskas uh, who was born in Lithuania but raised in uh, England. Uh, and uh, I really hope that uh, in the future uh, more guys and girls will come to to the UFC and we will see uh, like way more uh, people representing uh, our flag and all of our country. So that's my biggest hope for, actually. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Do you have a fight coming up? Not yet. We're still waiting. <laughs> yeah. Well, and everything's so crazy too. So um, yeah, yeah. But I really hope that UFC gonna give me something in the near future. I already, I already want to fight badly. <laughs> yeah, we will definitely be staying tuned. And where can people follow you? Find you online? Yeah, sure. You can find me on Instagram. It's Yulia uh, Also Facebook. And actually, my Facebook is open, and uh, I take everybody as a friend request. It's still it's still open, so you can just uh, message me, and like I I always trying to message everybody back. <laughs> yeah, so easy, easy. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you again for taking the time and joining from across the world. I'm just so uh, so grateful, and really have loved our chat and just hearing more about you. So thanks again. <laughs> thank you that you asked me. Like that was a nice time for me. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, we will, we'll stay in touch. And when, when you get a fight, we'll be sure to follow along and um, yeah, maybe, maybe in a year we could have you back on and see how things are going. Yeah, sure. <laughs>